All right. Good afternoon. I'm Sujin Jez. I'm the CEO of California Compete, and I'm so happy you're able to join us for this webinar to explore ways higher education can better serve Californians with some college but no credential. Why? The urgency is clear. California is currently navigating a critical juncture marked by a shortfall of college educated professionals and a concerning decline in enrollment. Yet there's an opportunity to bridge this gap if we can shift our higher education system and structures to support these students to the finish line. This in turn will not only foster thriving communities, but also strengthen our economy and advance inclusive prosperity and the well being of our state. A few housekeeping items before we start, we go any further. Um, should you have any questions during the webinar, simply click on the Q&A icon located, located in the control panel and submit your question through there. We'll have, we will answer what we can via that function and we'll hold relevant ones for our panel for the later part of this webinar. We will also send the recording to everyone who registered after the event and it will also be posted on our website, californiacompetes.org. I'd love to begin by learning more about who joined us for this great discussion today. So what sectors do you represent? Um, those answering other, please share in the chat. We have students, early care, K-12, higher ed, employer and industry, workforce development, policy, philanthropy, media, other. And then our second question, um, if you selected higher education, what best describes your role? Instructional faculty, counselor advisor, administrator, staff, student, other, NA? Okay, I'll give you a few seconds to answer. Great. It looks like, not surprisingly, most of the folks joining this webinar identify as coming from the higher ed system. It's about three quarters. Also, great representation from K-12, about 10%. Policy, a little over 10%. And workforce development. A good chunk there also in other 8%. And for those from higher ed, we see about a third from staff, about a fifth are administrators, 13% other or counselor advisors, 7% as faculty. Curious to see what these others are. Um, oh, and I forgot our third question. What responsibilities did you juggle while you were in college for those who went? So it looks like most folks also juggled work. A good number, 13% for childcare, also for elder care, 23% other, and a lucky 10% who was able to focus on their studies and did not have to juggle other items. Okay. The folks can peruse the results on the poll results right there. Great. And for those of you who are not familiar with California Competes, I'll share a little bit about what we do. We aim to solve the state's most pressing social and economic problems by conducting rigorous higher education and workforce policy research. We use that research to guide decision makers in designing and implementing solutions that strengthen our economy and help our communities thrive. We view higher education as both a vaccine and an antidote against economic stagnation and social stratification for individual Californians, our communities, and the state's economy. We believe long-term economic growth for California will be accomplished through shared prosperity. How do we do this? We've identified four priorities that we see as being key to modernizing our higher education system. 
at the top, you'll see there, and for those on the call, very interested in, I'm sure, college access and success for adult learners. So ensuring that our higher ed system is both accessible and structured in a way that adult learners can enter and complete. Uh, and by adult learners, we really think about those that are you know, 25 and older, the traditional metric, but also those that are younger who have adult responsibilities, um, like we flagged in the poll like childcare, elder care, heavy work responsibilities. Also effective and accessible online education. And as you can see, these are cross cutting issues. So one thing we are pushing our state to really think about is not just is online ed good or bad, but frankly that the demand is huge. Um, we've identified 3.1 million Californians intend to go to college in the next two years and prefer exclusively online classes. Um, so our question that our state should be asking is, how do we deliver high quality, accessible online education? Third on that list um, is higher education and workforce alignment, is ensuring that our higher ed systems are delivering uh, programs of study that lead to good jobs, that can help address our state's pressing policy priorities and needs, whether it's climate change, or homelessness and housing affordability, um, the educator pipeline, we want higher ed to see itself and to deliver on addressing that our state has the individuals that can ensure that we can meet our state's, our state's needs. And then last but not least, coordinated policy setting and implementation. This really focuses on how do we center the individual and in policy making and policy implementation, not the government agencies, or institutional uh, impulses. So how do we ensure that policy makers, that state agencies, that higher ed work together to best serve the student and to have as seamless of a process as possible for students and prospective students. Great, so now for today's agenda. So, I'll turn it over to California Compete Senior Researcher, Dr. Laura Bernhardt, right after I walk through our agenda. Laura will share a little bit about California Attain, the research policy practice partnership that drives this work. Then she'll be joined by Jen Liberty, one of our amazing student researchers on this project. They will share highlights from the new research report we published today. Then we will have a conversation with great members of our California Attain partnership, including questions from participants today, and then I'll be back to wrap things up. I'm thrilled to turn it over to Dr. Bernhard, who led this research project. Awesome. Thanks, Sujin, uh, and welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for being here. So as Sujin mentioned earlier, and as many of you know, our state is facing a projected shortfall of college-educated professionals coupled with a concerning decline in enrollment. Simultaneously, there is an untapped potential of over 6 million adults who have some college but no credential. And so recognizing the importance of bridging this gap, we wanted to learn more about this population and how institutions can better serve them to meet our state's needs. I wanna recognize that many in higher education are already doing great work in supporting the SCNC and adult learner population. But in the face of enrollment declines, these efforts hold even greater significance. Um, as Sujin mentioned, we put together a research practice partnership with Sacramento State, Shasta Tahama Trinity Joint Community College District, and Project Attain, a regional nonprofit, to dig into these issues. We're in the midst of a two year study, which is focused on how we can re engage, re enroll, and propel the SCNC population to completion. Uh, so a little bit about our approach for this study. Um, first, we recruited adult learners as co-researchers. Um, as one always does, we conducted a review of the literature, and then we co-designed the study with our partners. Last spring, we conducted 52 in-depth interviews with Comebacker students from Shasta College and Sac State, and then engaged in deep analysis, sharing and validating findings with our practitioner partners. We allowed the students' stories to drive our findings and all of our recommendations stem directly from our student participants' experiences. 
Last summer, we presented the findings and recommendations to the partners who then selected an area to focus on for the second year of this study. And in year two, both Shasta College and Sac State have chosen to focus on academic probation and they're implementing selected recommendations. We're working alongside them to conduct a developmental evaluation and we look forward to sharing those findings with you all in the near future. But right now we're happy to, to say that after a year of speaking with Comebacker students and learning from their experiences, we've solved you know, all of the problems uh, for SCNC students. Um, just kidding, but we have put together a fantastic report that summarizes our findings and offers real actionable recommendations for colleges to meet comebackers where they are. We encourage you to download the full report from our website, and we've also put together um, a convenient one-pager with all of our recommendations that you can find on the website. I will now pass it over to Jennifer Liberty, one of our fantastic student researchers, who will present a few select findings from this work. Jennifer is a comebacker and adult learner. She completed her BA in psychology through the College of Continuing Education online program at Sacramento State in the spring of 2023 and is now pursuing a master's in psychology. Jen? Thank you, Laura, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Based on the research, we've broken up our recommendations into four main areas, which include adapting to meet the needs of today's students, conducting strategic outreach, removing enrollment barriers, and providing ongoing support to students. Within each section are multiple recommendations derived from the interviews we conducted. However, I'll only be reviewing a few today. As Laura mentioned, the full list is included in the one pager and report on the website. And it looks like in chat now. Um, next. We start with one of the biggest takeaways from our research, which is the need for higher education to adapt to meet the needs of today's students. Many of the comebackers we interviewed expressed their need for flexibility in pursuing their educational goal. For them, this meant flexibility in both learning modalities and structures, including such things as increasing the availability of online courses and providing more fully online degree programs across all majors. Sara, a single mother living in a rural area with limited job opportunities, expressed how if it was not for online classes, she would still be cleaning houses rather than giving back as a social worker in her community. As an adult learner, I also relate to the need for online programs, as I would not have completed my BA and be pursuing my master's without access to online programs. Next. Surprisingly, many students interviewed referenced placement on academic probation as a catalyst for their departure from school. They indicated there was no personal outreach after being placed on AP, rather just an often confusing and generic email that left them feeling unsupported and alone. Working in the tutor center, I saw many adult learners come in for help who felt overwhelmed and defeated. For most, it was not an academic struggle with material, rather they were struggling to manage personal and school responsibilities. Reframing academic probation notifications and providing academic support for students can help comebackers navigate their way back to success. Next. Upon their return to school, students face numerous enrollment barriers. Interviewees voiced that the loss of registration status upon their return was one of the most frustrating, frustrating issues they faced. The loss of priority registration hindered their ability to get into the remaining courses they needed. John, a military veteran who returned to school after a deployment, spent an extra semester enrolled due to his inability to register for the one remaining class he needed. I was lucky enough to be part of a program that gave all adult learners priority registration which eased the stress I felt around registration time. Eliminating barriers such as this will allow students to stay on track towards completion. Next. Providing ongoing support to comebackers as they navigate higher education can help to ease the burden of students. Facilitating a community of support can go a long way to strengthening the experience of adult learners. Bruce, a father and first-generation student who struggled with addiction, noted the support he received from the communications department while completing his degree. Serving as a tutor and a co-researcher, I've had the unique opportunity to see how working alongside other adult learners can help create a sense of understanding and belonging.
Laura, back to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jen. With the slow transition out of pandemic-induced responses, we find ourselves at a crossroads where we can return to the normal or we can shift higher education to be more responsive to today's students. Given the state's need for college-educated professionals to meet workforce demand and the fact that we have over 6 million SCNC adults, now is the time for our state's institutions to re-engage, re-enroll, and propel these learners to success. Without such institutional changes and in progress, Students like Natalie would not have been able to earn their degree, and we need more Natalies. As we've mentioned, our comprehensive list of findings and recommendations can be found in the report, and we invite you to read it and carry the torch for SCNC comebackers and adult learners at your campus and in your community. And with that, to help us unpack this exciting topic, let me introduce you to our esteemed panel of expert practitioners. Melanie Dixon currently serves as the Executive Director of Project Attain, focused on increasing education attainment of working age adults in the California Central Region. Previously, Melanie served as the eighth president of American River College, where she spearheaded initiatives to enhance student support services, increase graduation rates, and promote diversity and inclusion on campus. She has also served as Associate Vice Chancellor of Educational Services and Student Success in the Los Rios Community College District. As a comebacker herself, she knows the difficulties adults face in finding a pathway back to college and the value that adult learners bring in filling the workforce and skills gaps in the region. Benjamin Fell, PhD, is the Interim Associate Dean for Academic and Professional Programs in the College of Continuing Education at Sacramento State leading a team of 25 dedicated professionals to deliver programs that increase access to higher education and promote workforce development, particularly for adults seeking to update their skills and advance their careers. He is a professor of civil engineering and has chaired the university's curriculum policies committee and the College of Engineering and Computer Science Academic Council and served as a faculty senator for six years. Elizabeth Buffy Tanner, currently serves as Director of Innovation and Special Projects at Shasta Tahama Trinity Joint Community College District in Reading, where she works to position Shasta College as a leader in empowering adult learners to attain degrees and advance their careers. Her role includes overseeing the Accelerated College Education, also known as ACE, and the Bachelors through Online and Local Degrees uh, lovingly known as BOLD, these are great acronyms, Buffy, uh, that facilitate degree completion for working adults through flexible alternative pathways. She is currently a Council on Adult and Experiential Learning Ambassador, providing expertise and resources to support adult learners as they navigate on and off ramps between education and employment. I'm gonna stop screen sharing and in invite our panelists to join me in conversation. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to start, um, you know, each of you brings unique experiences and perspectives to this discussion, as well as the California Attain work overall. Could you share how your experiences brought you to California Attain and how they shape your approach in propelling your respective institution or organization as it relates to supporting adult learners or more specifically, the some college no credential population. Ben, do you want to start us off? Sure, that sounds great. Um, well, I was actually brought into this collaboration by a colleague of ours, Jenny Murphy, who um, at that point was serving as the Dean for the College of Continuing Education at Sac State mm -hmm. and is now in a vice president role at the university. Um, many of you know Jenny and have worked with her before. She's a passionate and effective leader in the area of supporting adult learners. Um, and I'm sure I can speak for the panelists and, and the research team that we wouldn't be where we're at now without having her as part of our team and the leadership that she brings. Um, personally, I've been at Sac State for 16 years and in continuing education for the last three. Uh, prior to my work in continuing education, I was in the classroom, as Laura mentioned, as a professor in civil engineering, um, served on several policy committees in the faculty senate and serve um, as an academic department chair as well. <clears throat> and I'd say through all of these experiences, perhaps the most surprising takeaway that I've learned is the sheer number of 
stakeholder voices who are at the table, who bring all of these competing priorities and perspectives, yet how infrequently the student voice and the student experience carries the most weight in some of those discussions. Um, so I think that's why that this work is so powerful is it highlights those experiences and it does a really great job of putting the student voice front and center where it should be. Um, and the adult learner population is a sizable one for us at Sac State that we really need to be paying careful attention to. Our data shows that approximately one in four students are 25 years or older, and one in three are student parents. At a university of give or take 30, 31,000 students, these are really big, big numbers um, for us to pay attention to in terms of student services and also our enrollment goals. So we have the study that highlights some extremely rich conversations with students um, and the reasons that they decided to stop out, but then also return to graduate. And then a very large population of students at our university who are likely experiencing very similar challenges. And this recipe starts emerging where there's a huge opportunity to increase access by focusing our work on student needs. Within our team in continuing education, um, which is in many ways a microcosm of the larger university, we focus on providing educational programs that structurally try to meet the needs of adult learners through online programs, flexible admissions, timelines, and compressed classes. And we're trying to do more and more work to meet additional needs, which include access to health and wellness services, um, increasing advising efforts, and the number of, of people that we have to do that important work, and also holistic retention efforts. Um, I also want to point out that um, as, as Jen mentioned, Jen Liberty was one of our students who went through one of our programs. And I think all of us in higher education have those star students who stand out through us, um, through our careers. And Jen certainly been one of those students going through our program, but then also part of this project. And we're really proud to be able to call her a, a fellow Hornet. Well-deserved bragging rights. Um, thank you so much, Ben. Buffy, would you like to add on? Sure. Um, so the state of California and, and indeed the nation has about 20% of adults with some college but no credential. Uh, in 2014-15, Shasta College was doing some research into our student population and our surrounding three-county region. We discovered that we had 31% of our adults over the age of 25 with some college, no credential. Now, we are the only po public post-secondary institution in a 10,000 square mile area, so we realized this was our problem to solve. We, I mean, students leave college for a variety of reasons, but when you have a third of your population that are in this boat, we recognize that we needed to examine what we were doing that contributed to that. So um, we launched the ACE program, Accelerated College Education, as an associate's degree completion program specifically for this population with compressed classes, cohorts, case management, consistent scheduling, and comprehensive pathways to really address the needs of our community, not just our former students who had started with us and left, but also our employers. We realized that um, our employers were didn't have access to students who had the credentials that they needed to get promoted, to move into more advanced positions, with more responsibility, et cetera. Um, the success of the ACE program meant that when Dr. Jenny Murphy, who was again at the time, the CSU Sacramento College of Continuing Education Dean, she reached out to us in 2017 when um, she was launching Project Attain, the Sacramento region um, nonprofit. Well, at the time, it was still very closely affiliated with Sac State. Um, she asked us to come talk to um, the attendees at the Project Attain Summit about how we recognize the need for a program for adult learners and what we created. And um, one of the summit attendees was California Competes. And from that experience, um, we all just kept talking to each other about the necessity for and our mutual desire to share our challenges and our successes about working with adult learners. Um, 
we wanted to keep talking to each other. We wanted to talk to other people. Um, and that led to regular meetings of what we're calling California Attain, um, which led to applying for this research grant through Kresge and working on this research project. And really, um, the research project and the student voice um, having student interviewees from both Shasta College, which is a, you know, a small to medium sized community college in rural far northern California, and Sacramento State, a large urban institution. Um, and what we were hearing from the students were very similar things. So that in itself is very meaningful when you have that kind of consistency of message from adult learners at very different institutions in very different environments. So um, we've, we've found the relationships that we formed through California Attain to be incredibly useful and this research project specifically to be very valuable. So I will turn it on over to Melanie. Thank you so much, Buffy. Uh, I think you all hit really the high points around the importance of connection right, and doing this work and sharing. Um, and so as Project Attain is a nonprofit, I, I have the great luxury of coming behind Dr. Murphy. Uh, you'll hear a theme of us singing her graces, mainly because of her contributions in this space around adult learners um, and recognizing the importance not only of research, uh, the importance of policy, but certainly the importance of listening to the adult learner. And so my opportunity to come into this particular project in August um, I was excited, one, to come in under California Attain and work with the partners that I'm working with to be thought partners, um, to share the data. And if we think about to the 3.1 million in the state, about a million of those are in the capital region, which, we're, which is where Project Attain is uh, situated to serve. And so I think for me, the reality of it is, is our ability to come together, share thoughts, uh, share perspective is really important and starting somewhere. Um, being able to rally around an idea and, and, and cultivate our energy uh, to support adult learners in that space. And this just happened to be uh, talking about academic probation, but certainly there are other topics that institutions, um, such as many of those that are attending today, have been tackling for years. The issues aren't new, um, but I think our ability to be able to lean in um, and set some shared goals in this particular region and across the state are really critical. And I appreciate the opportunity to participate on this project. Thank you all. Um, through this research initiative and the community of practice with California Attain, what were some of your biggest takeaways? And how do these findings impact your views on the challenges faced by adult learners and the SCNC population? Buffy, do you want to start us? Sure. I think it's really easy to think of adult learners as a special population and often within a boutique program on the edge of campus. In reality, especially at community colleges and commuter four-year universities, and as Ben mentioned at Sac State, most um, adult learning learner, adult team learners are the norm. Even among our traditional age students, age 18 to 24 year olds, most are working at least part-time, if not full-time, may already have a child or may have other response, other family responsibilities, caretaking for older relatives or younger siblings. So any strategies we end up implementing for adult learners and the some college no credential folks end up being positives for the general student population population. It's also easy to think of the some college no credential population as deficient. Oh, they lack recent experience with college, or maybe they lack experience period with college. They lack experience with online learning, their math skills are rusty, they have academic standing, financial holds, financial aid issues from when they were a student before. The reality is, they come to us with so many skills and the richness of life and work experiences. If somebody is working and parenting, they typically already have excellent time management, prioritization, and organizational skills. People who have been working for years have completed professional development and trainings. They know how to work in groups, they know how to work independently, and they know how to work for a variety of bosses, which lends itself to academic coursework. However, what our adult learners have in common is that time is a precious resource and they do not have time to spare. So it is incumbent upon us as academic institutions to find ways to not 
waste their time. Programs that utilize um, alternative scheduling, compressed classes, enable students to focus on fewer classes at one time, but still be enrolled in a full-time status, which allows students to access full-time financial aid, support programs that require full-time enrollment, and also make better time to completion, because ultimately, these folks want to finish. Um, programs that utilize consistent scheduling and or fully online classes allow students flexibility as well as the ability to plan ahead with childcare and work schedules. If you provide a complete and comprehensive pathway along with individualized education plans, you eliminate barriers to students' completion because number one, they understand exactly what they need to do when they are going to finish, and you can reassure them that what they need to do and take will be available to them rather than getting any surprises at the end. Like, oh, well, you still need to take this class, but that's offered Tuesday, Thursdays in the middle of the day. Good luck working your, your work schedule around that. Case managers or coaches allow students to have one point person for their questions, which reduces the amount of wasted times that they call around to different offices on campus to get the answers that they need so they can move forward. And cohorts can lead to better peer supports and reduce a student's sense of otherness. Am I the only person doing college this way? As well as loneliness, cohorts can be tricky because they also reduce flexibility for students starting in a particular program. So institutions need to be really careful when they're thinking about using cohorts about whether or not that's going to be the best, um, the best thing for students. And then really, what wastes student time more than a student sitting in a class when they already know the content? Employing things like credit for prior learning and competency-based education recognizes that college level learning can and does happen outside of our college classrooms. And we can and should find ways to evaluate our adult learners experiential learning for academic credit. So this research project that we've done reinforced a lot of these adult learner best practices for us, but it also brought to the forefront some hidden challenges that we hadn't fully recognized as issues namely our academic probation process and language. Thank you, Buffy. That was fantastic. Um, ben, you mentioned this um, in your earlier response, um, really about what bringing the students to the forefront of our work. So the heart of this research lies in the voices of our comebacker students um, from you know, employing them as co-researchers, the design of the project, the development of the recommendations. Um, we heard the challenges, the obstacles, and also the, su the successes of our students. How can institutions and decision makers translate these insights into actionable changes to improve student outcomes? And what steps can be taken to bridge the gaps between understanding the challenges and implementing effective solutions? Yeah, and I hope that everyone has the opportunity to take a look at the report and, and read some of the testimonials that are in there. Um, they're not all of them, obviously, because there's, I think, 52 interviews done, but they're a great summary of, of the conversations that were had. And I'd say after reading most of them that were conducted, the student stories that we have are honest, they're heartbreaking, and they're inspiring all at the same time. I remember first reading them and having this reinvigorated commitment of wanting to create all these different types of changes um, within our team, but then also trying to do that at the larger university to help them out and also help out future students. And I think if there's one overarching theme that I'm taking away from all of this work is that we really have to focus on taking intentional actions from our hearts to avoid unintentional heartless actions. In other words, how do we approach decision-making through a compassion-based lens in order to avoid consequences that our students would see as unsympathetic? Um, it's so important to our work that we, that we have this focus because there's all these downstream implications and impacts of policy decisions and processes that can harm students if we don't keep that forefront in our minds. Even word choices uh, when it comes to classifying student status, as Buffy's mentioned, phrases like, probation, disqualification, um, dismissal, they may seem minor, 
and just part of our routine at the university, but they have significantly negative impacts because they're entrenched in this deficit mindset. Um, and finally, while the student stories are, are certainly poignant and, and they're, they're within uh, the larger report that's been put together, we actually didn't hear anything surprising that hasn't already been reported and is in existing literature. So for example, we know that increasing uh, learning outcomes so that they're more, more flexible and have online and hybrid learning are positive for students. Um, we need to use inclusive marketing materials. We need to refrain from that deficit language, offering credit for prior learning, um, reviewing catalog right policy so that after an extended period of time, a student um, isn't uh, disadvantaged by having catalogs change on them. So these are all things that I think probably most thought leaders in higher education would recognize as areas for us to work on. Um, and I really hope that by adding the student narrative to the picture, it elevates the importance of those findings that are out there and have been, have been worked on through the years. Um, and I do love the report that California Competes has put out. There's even a one pager that summarizes a lot of the major findings that would, that's um, great just to have on your desk and as a quick reference. So yeah, the student voice, um, I think it really encourages us to double down on our commitment to our students in order to change policies and processes. Um, unfortunately, within systems that aren't necessarily accustomed to changing very quickly. So that's something for us all to work on uh, as a team. So a, a great, a great purpose for this team that's come together through California Tain. Melanie, did you want to add on? Uh, very briefly, just I think the report affirms what we already know, right? Um, and I think the 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 reality of it is, is we work really, really hard out in the field. We certainly work hard in our community-based organizations to support students and institutions to build capacity to serve adult learners. But the reality of it is, is the story is is still similar, right? That these same challenges that have occurred uh, back when I was going to school as an adult learner are still challenges that we have now, but they're being exacerbated by the pandemic and many other things, such as social unrest um, and, and many other challenges that we're all grappling with um, and, and our students are not exempt from that. So I would say it affirms what it is that students need from us. It, it highlights our need to incorporate them more in our planning processes. And I would say the who, right? Adult learners, but within that, there are demographics that we need to hear from. And we need to understand the challenges and the burdens um, for them specifically. And I'm speaking of students of color. I'm speaking of students with disabilities. I'm speaking of refugee students, right? Populations that not only navigating um, is challenged and sometimes foreign to them based on their educational opportunities back home. But I think also there's a friendliness that we're looking for. Um, so it's not adult serving institutions. It's about being an adult friendly institution to our adult learners. Um, and so I think the report highlights that need um, and certainly creates space and opportunity for us to constantly remind ourselves of the gaps. Thank you. Um, Melanie, you brought up sort of some of the, the current issues right today. So not only obviously after COVID-19, uh, there was this significant catalyst for change in higher education um, and also just the heightened awareness around sort of social justice issues, notably those related um, to race. And then on top of all of that, California and the nation are, are dealing with ongoing enrollment decline and workforce gap issues. Um, I'd love to hear from each of you if you can talk a little bit about how this current landscape is influencing the way that your institution or organization has approached serving adult learners and what lessons you've learned from not just adapting, but actively galvanizing change in today's evolving higher education landscape. Buffy, did you want to start us off? Sure. I think, I think it's um, institutions really have to be willing to embrace change, bottom line. And, and that comes from your, your top leaders have to have that willingness to embrace change and innovation um, and really want to have the focus of the institution on the student. It, it, sounds, it sounds really simple and it is simple. It is hard to do. Um, but that, come, that comes from the top levels of administration, but it also really requires trust between 
that level of administration, um, other administrators, faculty, and staff. Positive relationships that are built on trust pave the way for positive inst institutional change that benefits our students. And what happens is that one improvement leads to another. As soon as you do one thing that makes students' lives better, you can't stop seeing the other roadblocks that they're experiencing. And then you want to make the changes to make, um, to make those roadblocks go away because it's the right thing for students. Um, and, then, and then we kind of get into this, some call it initiative fatigue. Um, but really, change can be daunting and it can feel overwhelming at times, but we have to remember to stop for a minute every once in a while and enjoy the successes that we have made to changes in our institution and then get back on track to making the next change that's gonna make our institutions more student-centered. Um, but I, I think it really does come down to willingness, trust, and relationships. Fantastic, thanks, Buffy. Ben, did you wanna add something? I, I, I keep thinking about this commitment to our students and how our, our North Star or our, our mission has to always go back to making sure that they're at the forefront of decision-making. Um, and I think in times of declining enrollments and budget problems, Laura, like you mentioned, to pose the question, this is a really important thing to keep in mind because as budgets may decrease, there might be a look to um, suspend or pause services for students. Um, but we have to realize that our students are also in this mode of perhaps survival, um, shrinking budgets, uh, many, many obligations in, in their life. And so I guess I often worry that as you shrink support services for students, you're putting them in a position where they have to make a, diff a difficult decision about their life priorities. Um, and perhaps education is something that they decide to pause and come back to later on. And so then that creates this downward spiral, right? Where now you've created a situation where because of the lack of support, perhaps there's less students who are deciding to continue, to come back, to graduate. Um, and so then that affects enrollment, right? And then that affects budget and then the budget implications about additional services to suspend or pause and this creates this downward spiral. So I tend to think that if we keep focusing on what are those guiding principles in the North Star, um, things like workforce development, um, individual growth, and development an educated population. Um, if we focus on, on those things and try to set up our, our system so that those goals are met, um, the other things I, I hope would, would start taking care of themselves in a way. Um, and so there's, there just needs to be this all in commitment uh, to support our students um, with the mindset that that's a long-term strategy for our institutions. I would just echo the importance of equity and inclusion in this particular, um, to this end. I, I think all of the things around support services are necessary and reminding ourselves that attainment for attainment's sake isn't a thing in the 21st century. People are going to get educational attainment to land the career that they're seeking for themselves, for their families. Um, and I think that's important for us to recognize as we're developing curriculum, as we're partnering with our industry, um, and as we're thinking about our students, uh, not only educational goals, but career goals. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, we have some great questions coming through in the chat. So I'm going to turn it over to some of our participants and um, panelists. The first question is really about advising. Um, so someone shared their own personal experience being a comebacker student. Um, and just getting conflicting advice, which extended their time to degree. Um, what might be some steps that institutions can take to improve advising and smooth a pathway for students uh, to transfer and complete? So one of the things that we've done at Shasta College is we have designated counselors who work specifically with our adult learner returners. Um, and so 
a lot of times these students, you know, after they left us, they may have tried school at another institution for a little while, or, um, or before they even come to us, they may have attended a number of institutions. So one of the first things is, um, if you want to participate in the ACE program, uh, it's not an application, but we do have an intake form, and we ask the student a lot of questions about what's happening in their life right now. And we do require them to upload copies of um, even unofficial transcripts so that we can get a sense of what coursework that they have previously taken in addition to anything that they've taken at our institution. So the very first thing that happens before they start classes is they sit down with a counselor and they review what coursework is already completed and what they need to do and then sit down and map out a term by term plan for completing the rest of that coursework. Um, and then what happens is with each term, each eight week block of classes, um, we have staff that monitor if students have completed what was on their educational plan and if they've registered for the next batch of classes that are on their educational plan. And if anything doesn't match up, that student immediately gets a call. Um, and an email saying, hey, it looks like you're diverting from your educational plan. I'm going to set you up an appointment with our counselor so you can talk. Is something changed? Have your plans changed? So because having over 300 units is wildly horrible um, for a student, both in time and money. And I'm so sorry that happened to you. Um, but we are really working hard to make sure that that doesn't happen to students going forward. If I would just, that, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll hop in really quickly and turn it over to Ben. Um, I, I think not withholding in, uh, information from students. The great thing about adult learners is they're very resourceful. Um, and so unlike our traditionally aged students that sometimes need a little more support coming through because they're used to that in their K through 12 experience, sometimes adult learners know how to access the information and can navigate quite well. So I think in conjunction with counselors, advisors, being able to have information readily available for folks that have the ability to be able to find it for themselves, because a lot of time institutions run into capacity issues, you just don't have enough counselors and advisors for your students. So making sure that for those that have the ability to navigate with a lot less support, um, have that particular option and those uh, less, um, I would say trained uh, supports in place to navigate the system, I think, would be advantageous for an institution and certainly our adult learners. I don't want to, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm going to move us along to the next question because this is a hot topic and then you'll get first, first rates. Um, so we had a question about supporting students who have been put on academic probation and another question about um, students who have been academically disqualified um, and perhaps running into issues with satisfactory academic progress, which ultimately may affect their eligibility for financial aid. Um, we are wondering uh, if you all have model programs, interventions, and or student success strategies to support these students. Ben. <clears throat> yeah, I think I can speak just generally to the, to the problem kind of going back to um, my experience when I was department chair and a lot of students who are having the SAP appeal um, uh, are going through the SAP appeal process and also at the same time kind of this Venn diagram of possibly also being on academic probation status. Um, I, I struggle using that that phrase now after we've been working on this project for multiple years and, and <laughs> saying academic probation and knowing that we're going to try to make the move to try to change it to something else that doesn't have the deficit um, language attached to it. But yeah, I, I think that this is a, a great opportunity for institutions and universities to streamline two processes where students are are faced with um, a financial uh, hurdle that they have to kind of overcome and, and document in terms of what are the courses that they're going to take in the future and how are how is that structure of courses going to lead to ultimate success um, and kind of viability financially moving forward and also academic probation. I think too often those things may take place um, in parallel to one another, but 
but the processes perhaps and the people involved aren't aren't talking to one another. And so then you have a student in a situation where um, they're replicating efforts, they're replicating materials, um, really to get to the same point of, of being able to continue their education. So it seems like a, a great opportunity to, to streamline processes and, and those procedures. Um, in terms of in terms of things that are are working here um, at Sac State to, to do that, I think you know there's some departments who are who are really forward looking and have some student success centers within their college that have the right people in the right places in order to to do that work, and then probably other parts of the university who um, are still trying to kind of catch up and try to streamline those processes even more. So I think recognizing that and and calling it out is a really great example of how we can support our students so that they're not having to constantly repeat um, a justification for a perceived failure on their part and having to basically just tell their story once, try to try to move forward with their education. Thank you. Uh, we had another great question about credit for prior learning and competency-based education. Um, the question is about California community colleges um, that are actively developing these, these policies and, and programs. Um, and they wanted to know if there are members of the CSU and UC system that are ready to accept transfer students who have earned credits via these mechanisms. I can try to go again, Laura, on okay. that. Um, so I think it was 2022 or so when the the 23 campus CSU system came out with, I believe it was an executive order at the time establishing the need for campuses, individual campuses to create credit for prior learning policies. So they basically set up um, a skeleton type policy with, with basic criteria and constraints around credit for prior learning. And then campuses were then asked to design their own system of, of implementation. Um, I know at Sac State, we're currently in the position of having an interim policy for credit for prior learning. Um, and that policy, I think is, is re still at the faculty senate level in terms of what that's actually going to look like once it goes from interim status to now a full-fledged policy that departments and colleges can work with for credit for prior learning. Um, I will say that in terms of awarding that credit, um, I think the CS, I think the, the, the community colleges um, have processes and, and procedures that re we really need to look to to learn from. Um, one, because like there's this interaction as the question, uh, as the question alluded to, there's this interaction between community colleges and the CSU system for transfer students, but also there's just a lot of many years of great experiences to learn from, from the community college that I think we could take advantage of. So not needing to reinvent, reinvent that wheel. Um, but I guess just going back to kind of where we are, um, because we are, are still working through some of those, those policy languages, um, haven't really set up that, that structure uh, that we really need to do this at full scale. But uh, we're looking forward to that. And we're recognizing that that's a really important thing that that we need to be doing. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I think uh, Buffy answered this question in the chat about student services. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add about adjusting academic programs, but also having to sort of fill out your student support services, Buffy. So my response was basically that COVID-19 actually really helped in this regard because everybody needed to figure out how to provide services online um, to the broader student population, which was a huge boon to our adult learners. Um, our office was included. I mean, we always, we always offered um, phone appointments or in-person appointments to our adult learners, but with the advent of using Zoom, now we can do Zoom online 
on Zoom in-person or phone appointments. Um, but our, our tutoring services are still offered via Zoom or in-person. Um, our health services appointments are via Zoom or in-person and so on and so forth. We're still cracking the nut on getting um, various offices to provide supports after 5 p.m. Um, we make sure our office does and our tutoring learning center is available after 5 p.m. But not everybody's available after 5 p.m. That is still a challenge. I am gonna stop us there. Thank our panelists so much for joining in this great conversation and sharing their expertise. Um, I'm going to bring Sujin back, and while she joins us, I also just really want to recognize um, our three student co-researchers on this project, uh, for whom we would not have been able to talk to as many students as we did, uh, and also the whole California Competes team. Um, and Sujin, we'll bring you, we'll bring you back. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Melanie, Ben, Buffy, Jen, um, the California Team Partnership for this amazing work. Um, I'm going to wrap us up and point us towards the next year of work that continues on, focused on, I was excited to see, I like the many comments that focused on the rollback and reprobation, the impact of grades, satisfactory academic progress, um, but that's something that we're tackling head on in California Attain. So stay tuned perhaps this time next year, another webinar um, where we'll talk about that work. Um, I want to end with a, a, a quick call to action um, to galvanize the folks here. And I know we had so much conversation in the chat and the Q and A, and I'm sad that we weren't able to get to everything, um, but I know this conversation will continue and you guys have our contact info. We love hearing from folks. Um, so I was gonna turn it back to our California team partners if they wanted to share their um, a quick, call to action for the participants on this call. What should they be thinking about doing next from, from where you sat thinking about this work for years, if not decades? My call to action would be don't talk about it, be about it. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of talking in education and much of it's necessary to do problem solving, but a lot of times we know the problems um, and we just need to move forward in some way, small or large, um, and just take action. And so that would be my my call to action to the individuals participating today. Thanks for the opportunity. And I, I would echo that. Pick something, pick anything, and just start working on it. Bring folks together. Um, and yes, you're going to need to talk about it, but don't talk about it too long. Get to it. Make a change. And I guess to round things out, listen to the students as we're doing all of those change making um, processes and, and procedures. Keep their voice in the forefront. Well, thank you so much. I encourage everyone to take a look at the report and the one pager. Um, don't hesitate to reach out to me or Dr. Bernhardt if you have questions or I. I We'll open it up to the California Tain partnership to the folks on this panel. Um, we love this work and we are more than happy to talk more about it. All right, thank you everyone. It's 1 p.m. ending on time. Enjoy the rest of your afternoons.